why they so Deadly crash. Countless people remain unaccounted for in India's worst train disaster in decades. Erasing history. Hong Kong cracks down on protesters commemorating the atrocities of Tiananmen Square massacre. Oil shortage imminent? Saudi Arabia pledges to reduce the output of crude oil in the month of July by over 1 million barrels. What is the reason for this sudden reduction? Find out tonight. Eliminating night. Experience a dim night in Thailand as thousands of lanterns light up in celebration of the food. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening to you on this Monday night and you are watching the news. We start up tonight in our neighbouring India which faced one of the worst train disasters of this century so far. Desperate relatives searched for loved ones missing after India's worst train disaster in decade claimed the lives of at least 275 people. As India's railway minister said, the cause and the people responsible for the crash has been identified, pointing out an electronic signal system without giving further details. As workers clear up the remaining wrecked trains, preliminary investigations are pointing to a signal failure as the likely cause of the crash that killed hundreds of people in India's worst train disaster in decades and wounded over a thousand more. Railway Minister Ashwini Vaisho was at the scene on Sunday. According to a preliminary investigation, one passenger train, the Coromandel Express, heading to Chennai from Kolkata, moved out of the main track and entered what's called a loop track, which is used to park trains, at about 80 miles per hour. It crashed into a parked freight train doing so. That crash caused the train to jump the tracks, topple and hit another train heading in the opposite direction and at about the same speed, according to a member of the railway board. The drivers of both passenger trains were injured but survived. Indian authorities say they have now concluded rescue operations. At a business centre, where bodies were being taken for identification, dozens of relatives waited many weeping and clutching identification cards and pictures of missing loved ones. Seema Chowdhury's husband was going to the city of Chennai to work on the evening of the crash. She is still looking for him at the center. I have been to all the hospitals and have found out nothing. Now I'm going to Bhubaneswar to find out. I just need my husband. I don't want anything else. <laughs> Families of the dead will get 1 million rupees or about $12,000 in compensation, while the seriously injured will get 200,000 rupees with 50,000 rupees for minor injuries. Over in China, Hong Kong police searched and detained scores of people, including four arrested, for seditious intent as authorities tighten security for the 34th anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. A pro-democracy activist was among scores detained by Hong Kong police, along with at least four people arrested, as authorities tightened security on the 34th anniversary of China's bloody crackdown on protesters in Tiananmen Square. Restrictions in Hong Kong have stifled what were once the biggest vigils and memorials, marking the 1989 student demonstrations, leaving cities outside Chinese control to keep alive the memory on the June 4th anniversary. Among those detained on Sunday were Alexandra Wong, a prominent democracy activist known as Grandma Wong. Another person detained was carrying the script of theatrical play May 35th. The play has not been performed in Hong Kong since the year 2020, before the enactment of a national security law that Beijing imposed on the city later that year. The play tells the story of a husband and wife dealing with the loss of their son who was killed when troops opened fire on democracy protesters in and around Tiananmen Square 34 years ago. This performance was staged in Taipei, Taiwan last week, a democratic self-governing island that Beijing claims is part of China. On Sunday, Taiwanese residents held a vigil of the sort now impossible in Hong Kong. One attendee there told the crackdown in Hong Kong hurt her. She said she felt very sad for the city and did not believe it was going to return to the past era of political freedom. Others said Taiwanese needed to stand up for freedom, a value they cherished. Beijing has staged military drills around the island and harshly criticized the American government's ties to Taiwan. 
In a sign of ongoing tensions in the region, a Chinese warship came within 150 yards of a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait in what American officials described as an unsafe manner. It came as U.S. and Canadian navies were conducting a joint exercise in the strait, which separates the island of Taiwan from mainland China. China blamed the United States for deliberately provoking risk in the region. In the Middle East, Saudi Arabia will make a deep cut to its output in July on top of a broader OPEC plus deal to limit supply into 2024 as the group seeks to blow flagging oil prices. Saudi Arabia on Sunday said it would dramatically cut its crude oil output as part of a deal by OPEC plus nations to tighten supply into 2024 as producers seek to boost falling oil prices. The Saudi energy minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman al Saud, referred to the million barrel cut as the Saudi lollipop in that it sweetened a deal by fellow oil producers to curb production. And uh, I would have to call it the Saudi lollipop, which is a million barrel of reduction uh, for the start that starts at the 1st of July. And it, that million is also extendable. Saudi's energy ministry said the country's output would drop to 9 million barrels per day in July from around 10 million barrels in May, the biggest reduction in years. OPEC Plus, which groups the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and allies led by Russia, pumps around 40 percent of the world's crude, meaning its policy decisions can have a major impact on oil prices. A surprise decision to cut supply in April briefly sent international benchmark crude around $9 higher. But prices have since retreated under pressure from concerns about the weakness of the global economy and its impact on demand. Saudi Arabia is the only member of OPEC Plus with sufficient spare capacity and storage to be able to easily increase and curtail output. Senior officials from about two dozen of the world's top intelligence agencies have been holding secret meetings in Singapore for several years, including U.S. Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, and representatives from China. The existence of the meetings have never before been made public. Sources have revealed that senior officials from about two dozen of the world's top intelligence agencies have been meeting in secret in Singapore for years, including representatives from both the U.S. and China, meetings which have never before been made public, and there are few details known of what's being discussed. That's according to five sources, all anonymous due to the sensitivity. The meetings are said to happen on the fringes of a security summit called the Shangri-La Dialogue, which was just recently held this year, named for the Shangri-La Hotel. The summit hosts many world leaders and officials, but the spy chiefs have been going to a separate venue organized by the Singapore government. This year, the U.S. was represented by the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. It's not clear who represents China, but its presence there comes despite the many problems between it and U.S. allies. It's also said that the head of India's overseas intelligence agency, Samant Goel, attended. Russia did not attend this year, but the war in Ukraine was discussed at one point. International crime was also discussed. And there were few other specifics. One source said that the meetings are an important fixture of what they call the, quote, international shadow agenda, and that there is an unspoken code among intelligence services that they can talk to each other, even when more open and formal diplomacy is more difficult. The atmosphere is said to be collaborative and cooperative, not combatant. Large intelligence meetings like this between powers involving opposing ideologies are extremely rare and almost never publicized. At a time when relations between the two nations are tight, a top official from the U.S. State Department arrived in Beijing with meetings scheduled for the upcoming week. A senior U.S. State Department official will travel to China next week as Washington seeks to boost communication with Beijing at a time of tense relations between the two countries. The announcement of the visit came Saturday, just hours after U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, speaking in Singapore at Asia's top security summit, blasted China for refusing to hold military talks over territorial disputes in the South China Sea. 
You know, I am deeply concerned that the PRC has been unwilling to engage more seriously on better mechanisms, mechanisms for crisis management between our two militaries. A senior Chinese military official struck back at Austin, saying the U.S. was responsible for a breakdown in dialogue by ramping up sanctions on Chinese officials and destabilizing the Asia-Pacific region with its military presence. Ties between the world's two largest economies are at loggerheads over everything from the future of democratically ruled Taiwan, territorial claims in the South China Sea, and President Joe Biden's restrictions on semiconductor chip exports. For its latest diplomatic effort, the U.S. will send Daniel Crittenbrink, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, to China to discuss what the State Department called, quote, key issues in the bilateral relationship. Crittenbrink's trip follows a visit to China last month by CIA Director William Burns. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken postponed a planned February trip to China after an alleged Chinese spy balloon flew through U.S. airspace over sensitive military sites, kicking off a diplomatic crisis. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. The governor of Russia's Belgorod region stated that he was willing to meet a pro-Ukraine group of Russian partisans holding two Russian soldiers captive as he reported a renewed flare-up of fighting near the border. Grainy aerial footage released on Sunday by a militant group of Russians fighting on behalf of Ukraine purports to show its members storming into a suburb of the Russian city of Belgorod. The Freedom of Russia Legion and another group, the Russian Volunteer Corps, have claimed they've conducted a number of cross-border raids into Russian territory from Ukraine. Last week, Moscow said two civilians were killed during fighting. In a video posted to the Freedom of Russia's Telegram channel, a man identifying himself as the commander of the Russian Volunteer Corps said his fighters had captured two wounded Russian soldiers. The man offered to exchange them in a meeting with Belgorod's regional governor. The governor, Vyacheslav Gladkov, responded on his own Telegram channel. Gladkov said there was a battle going on with saboteurs and terrorists in a Russian border town. He said he was willing to meet with the militants to ensure the return of captives if they were alive. He gave the name of a border checkpoint and a time. But later on Sunday, the militant group said it would hand over the prisoners to Ukraine after the governor failed to turn up as promised. Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year has in recent weeks and months come home to Russia. Gladkov said Ukrainian forces shelled Belgorod over the weekend, adding that 4,000 residents were relocated for their safety. Ukraine has denied attacks inside Russia. Meanwhile, Russian bombardment of Ukrainian cities continues. Ukrainian officials said a Russian missile attack on the city of Dnipro killed a two-year-old girl and injured at least 22 people could not independently verify the report. There was no immediate reaction from Moscow. The border skirmishes and airstrikes come as Ukraine readies an expected counterattack against Russian forces occupying swaths of Ukrainian territory in the country's east. Kiev on Sunday made a plea for operational silence ahead of the assault, discouraging public speculation over when and where it might strike. Now on to aviation news. As summer travel season kicks off, the Federal Aviation Administration is under pressure over the emergency evacuation standards that airlines must meet. Some members of Congress say the requirement to evacuate everyone in just 90 seconds is unrealistic. From a Toronto passenger plane in 2018 to Chicago 2016, San Francisco 2013, plane emergencies are chaotic and terrifying. There's people running around an aircraft on fire. But to get hundreds out alive, the FAA relies on rules set in the 1960s. And with half the exits blocked, 
But look at the FAA's most recent evacuation test in 2019. No fire, no smoke, no screaming babies, elderly, obese or disabled passengers, no carry-on bags, no panic. It's not realistic at all. Senator Tammy Duckworth, a pilot disabled from wartime injuries, now pushing legislation to require real-world evacuation standards. What's at stake here is the safety of the flying public and the ability of first responders and cabin crews to do their jobs to keep us safe. While everyone survived the 2009 miracle on the Hudson, hero Captain Sully Sullenberger says it took longer than 90 seconds. It took over three minutes to get the 155 people, the full load of passengers and crew, out of our aircraft successfully. Though the FAA says it reviewed nearly 300 real-world evacuations with diverse passenger demographics and found safety to be very high. But from Congress to pilots to flight attendant unions, concerned that 90 seconds isn't long enough. Still in the United States, a law that suspends the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling for the U.S. government was signed by President Joe Biden, preventing a first ever default in the world's largest and the most powerful economy. After months of tense negotiations between Democrats and Republicans, U.S. President Joe Biden on Saturday signed the debt ceiling bill, suspending the U.S. government's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling and averting what within days would have been a first-ever government default. A video of Biden signing the bill appeared on the president's Twitter account, and the White House in a statement thanked top Senate and House leaders from both parties. The bill signing came a day after Biden hailed it as a bipartisan triumph in his first ever Oval Office address to the nation as president. There were extreme voices threatening to take America for the first time in our 247-year history into default on our national debt. Nothing, nothing would have been more irresponsible. No one got everything they wanted, but the American people got what they needed. Both parties cobbled together an 11th hour deal that suspends the debt limit until January 2025 and caps spending, and it passed through the Senate and the House this week. In the end, Republicans won about $1.5 trillion in spending reductions over 10 years, which may or may not be fully realized. Their opening bid was for $4.8 trillion in savings over a decade. Both parties walled off the sprawling Social Security and Medicare retirement and health care programs from cuts. Despite the Treasury meeting its debt obligations, the possibility of another U.S. credit rating downgrade is still on the table. Fitch Ratings on Friday said the United States' AAA rating remains on negative watch. It cited repeated political standoffs and last-minute suspensions for, quote, lowering confidence in governance on fiscal and debt matters. Prince Harry is preparing to testify early this week in a lawsuit against Mirror Group newspapers that accuses the organization of unlawful information gathering. He will be the first senior royal to testify in court in more than 100 years. Tonight, anticipation mounting as Prince Harry prepares to testify in court early this week, the first senior royal to do so for more than 100 years. The prince is one of several celebrities suing Mirror Group newspapers, accusing them of unlawful information gathering between 1991 and 2011, including phone hacking allegations. The prince's lawsuit is one of several cases Harry and wife Meghan have brought against the tabloid press, who they say have repeatedly invaded their privacy. Through his lawyer, Harry alleges that press intrusion presented very real security concerns, caused huge distress and paranoia, put unnecessary stress and strain on his relationship with a former girlfriend. But royal experts warn a lot is on the line for Harry. The newspaper group has apologized and admitted its journalists obtained information illegally in the past, but deny claims in the lawsuit that suggest the practices were widespread and that senior executives were aware. A fight playing out in the public eye, but despite the risks, Prince Harry says he's focused on changing the media landscape. A big step in what Prince Harry hopes will establish an important precedent. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world. 
Verstappen cruised to yet another victory at Formula 1 Spanish Grand Prix. But the stars of the weekend were the eight-time F1 World Constructors champions Mercedes AMG, whose Lewis Hamilton and George Russell ended in a 2-3 double podium, lifting hopes for many for a return of Mercedes domination in the sport. A woman in prison for 20 years over the death of her four children was pardoned by New South Wales State after judiciary found there was reasonable doubt about the original convictions. Kathleen Megan Folvig was convicted in 2003 for the murder of her three children and manslaughter for her fourth. Clashes between Sudan's warring parties escalated in the capital cotton following the expiration of a fragile ceasefire deal that had brought some respite from a weeks-long conflict. The fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the rival rapid support forces has persisted despite repeated truces. The Shenzhou 15 crew who said to return to Earth after their six-month stay in China's space station brought back more than 20 kilograms of experimental samples in life and material science. The fourth batch of space scientific experimental samples from the Tiangong space station were handed over to the space application system at the Dongfeng landing site in North China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. Flooding caused a gold mine to collapse in southern Venezuela, killing at least 12 miners, local authorities said, adding that the victims' bodies were returned to their families. Talavera Mine, located in El Calo in Venezuela's Bolivar state, flooded due to heavy rains, but rescue workers could not finish recovery efforts. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally tonight, we visit Thailand's Patum Thani province, where over 100,000 lanterns were illuminated over the grand meditation stadium to celebrate the good deeds of the Buddha. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your evening.